Think about these words for a moment. Sex, abortion, adoption, abstinence, consent. What feelings were evoked when those words were spoken? Uncomfort? Fear? I always question why those words evoke such strong emotions. I remember the uncomfortable feelings of having the talk. I felt shame when even thinking about sex, and add on to the fact I was a closeted queer kid didn't help either. And then I remember the first time having sex. I cried because I didn't understand how it was supposed to work. I was taught a very loose understanding of what a sexual relationship actually was, and it was more than just penis and a vagina. Sex has so many levels to it, and one of our levels is our boundaries. We have our hardline boundaries, the boundaries we won't allow anyone else to cross. What is important is that you believe in those boundaries. What can and has happened in my own personal experience is that someone makes me question those boundaries, and that is when the lines become blurry. This is when we second guess ourselves. When a boundary has been crossed once, it is then easy for it to be crossed and pushed back a second time. We must advocate and stand by ourselves. If we don't do that, who will? Only nine states require the importance of consent to be taught in sexual health education classes. Neither Georgia, Alabama, or Tennessee are included in those states. We are taught about sex from an early age and that no means no. This means any sort of sexual contact, a touch on the leg or shoulder, a kiss, clothes coming off, even during intercourse. Communication is key. What, what happens though when we get older? Sometimes boundaries can become blurry. They change with our level of comfort. A couple of years ago, I met a guy. The typical heteronormative relationship timeline happened. They kiss, they go on a date, they spend the night. They might end up in a relationship and live happily ever after. But this had a different ending. It ended in an unplanned pregnancy, an unplanned pregnancy that was 100% preventable. I remember the conversations I tried having with him that we needed to be tested for STIs and that we needed to use condoms and we needed to do this and that. And I remember even telling him that we could not support a child in the leg of life either of us were in at the time. I spoke up for my boundaries, but it wasn't taken seriously. If someone does not want to listen to your boundaries, that is not only a red flag, but enough to end the relationship point blank. If someone does not pay attention to your boundaries at the beginning of the relationship, what happens when more serious issues come into play? What happens when the inevitable argument, or in my case, a profound decision must be made between the parties? I remembered each month would pass and I would let him cross my boundaries because I did not stand up for myself and push back. I somehow led myself to believe that I could be immune to what happened in May of last year. When I looked at the positive pregnancy tests in my hand, my mind was racing. Where do I go from here? How do I cope? Who do I talk to? Am I keeping this? There are three choices when faced with an unplanned pregnancy. You go on to become a parent, you terminate the pregnancy, or the lesser chosen, lesser known, and less talked about option. You carry the child to term, and then you put that child up for adoption. I already knew I couldn't be a parent, so that knocked the first choice out. Then there were those of not being a parent. When weighing those options, the laws governing my reproductive organs were plastered all over the news. Was I going to jail if I chose abortion? And then there were just the common questions of if my body could handle it, and if that would allow me to still have children later on down the road if I so choose. Many people put into the situation as I do, either see it as abortion or become a parent, and rightly so. When faced with the option, many can't fathom growing, nurturing, and growing a human than to not ever see them again on a consistent basis. Also living in the Bible Belt weighed on me heavily. 
it seems around here that an unwed pregnant person is a lot more acceptable than someone who has terminated a pregnancy, even marginally so. By July 2019, I had my tentative plan of an adoption. When finding an agency to go through, there were so many that popped out at me. I decided to focus on the LGBTQ affirming agencies and then on to researching families. I spoke with the adoption coordinator and she sent off a few lists to research. In, in, those, in those lists, there were pages upon pages of eager awaiting people ready to be parents. I landed on a few selections, listed them off to the coordinator, and then was set up with a phone call. In that first phone call, I met the parents of the baby. As I spoke more and more with them, I started to become more and more sure of the option that I choose. I also knew that someday I would need to tell this story and I would want this to be as fact-based as possible and why I chose an adoption over the other two. Normalizing the choice of adoption is another step to creating a safe space for those who are unsure of the path they must take. No two adoption processes are alike. There are three types of adoptions, open, semi-open, and closed. I let each option sit within me, thinking of the possible outcomes of each. Speaking with the parents every so often, they wanted to hear what I had to say about how much involvement I would want to have in the relationship. We collectively came to the choice of semi-open. We don't have any set rules of how the relationship should look, but we have respect for each other's boundaries, and as time goes by, it will change just as our lives do. Being faced with something as life-altering and life-stopping as an unplanned pregnancy, I had to allow myself the love and patience I knew I needed in times like these. I picked up the phone and called my mom. I knew that if I had at least one person in my corner, I was going to be okay. She did tell me that it would be okay, but I wouldn't believe her till nine months later. This wasn't a secret to keep or try to hide. It becomes glaringly obvious as the time goes by. So the one thing I would push the most if you are in this situation is to find your support system, whether that is online or in person or a mix of the two. The parents would chat with me every so often to ensure I had what I needed. They were excited for what was to come. When I would speak to them on what I wanted, they were attentive and respectful. They understood the emotional weight I was carrying with me and wanted to support the decisions I not only needed to make, but wanted to make. I tried to go into the adoption with an open mind. I started to obsess with how others would view this. And then a friend said to me, think of it as a surrogacy and my whole mindset shifted. I became more accepting of my circumstance and was able to focus on what was important, growing a human and nurturing a parent-child relationship as much as possible. Coming out and telling people I was pregnant was one thing, but then to announce that I was putting the child up for adoption was another thing. I decided to be blunt in my announcement. I put it all out there, letting everyone know this was my truth. I have been taught before that if you want to control the narrative, you must put yourself on blast. To be as truthful in the situation leaves no room for there to be miscommunication. Owning what is happening leaves no room for uns unsolicited judgment. From there, I got messages and likes and support from friends on the internet and personal friends. I was not afraid of the possible judgment that could have been placed on my shoulders. I was doing what was best for me and my situation. Researching support for adoption came up with a lot of resources. I found Facebook pages and groups, websites dedicated to the journey, and even Instagram pages for birth moms. I joined in trying to find the support I longed for, but knew that that wasn't the right choice. So I decided to forge my own path and look into ways to support myself. Being one's biggest supporter helps. When you wholeheartedly believe that the choices you are making will impact your life in a positive way, it becomes easier to handle the hard things. When looking for the support systems I thought I could benefit from, it all seems so rigid and callous. 
which was not the perspective I was looking for. That to me was a sign that I should look to support myself in the way that I needed to and stick to fact-based research instead of feelings-based research. Because once other feelings become involved, it is harder to see through to our own. When going through the realization of how preventable the situation was, I dealt with a lot of anger. Anger towards myself and anger at the guy. The man that I slept with was not only the father of one, but the possible father of two, meaning unprotected sex is something that he does quite frequently. He did not grasp the weight that he carried. Those who cannot become pregnant by someone else will not understand the mental labor of those who can. The first few times we did use condoms as it was the easier obtainable protection. Then I realized he wasn't taking me seriously. He tried to enter in me as I said no and gestured towards the condoms. I could feel his apprehension. As a cisgender woman, I know all too well the comments that cisgender men make. I can't feel it. I can't get or stay hard. It's not the same. And why do we give in? We are in our most vulnerable state a hot body on another hot body, just wanting to feel something beyond surface level. I was on the pill form of contraception for about a month during that relationship. It made me feel confused and disoriented. I bled for a month straight, and it left me feeling fatigued. I ended up stopping, letting him know, and pushing for condoms again. He would say, okay, and then continue to push for sex with, without them. I lay there wondering why I kept letting him and why I didn't advocate for myself in such a vulnerable time. Growing up, abstinence-based sexual health education was pushed as one of the only forms of safe sex. Even now from the Guttmacher Institute, Georgia's sexual health education does not have to be medically accurate, age appropriate, or culturally appropriate or unbiased. Georgia and Tennessee are not required to include consent in their curriculum. They do, though, require abstinence and marriage-only sex ed as main point of curriculum. Growing up conservative and religion, religious, abstinence is the main option of birth control heavily pushed on to us. Abstinence-only sex ed made me fear communication with my partners and left me confused on how a healthy sexual relationship should operate. One person does not get to dictate how sex looks like in a relationship. If one person is uncomfortable with something, then it becomes a boundary for the relationship. As I got older, I started to realize there were so many forms of birth control. I've tried out several types of pills, condoms, natural family planning, and now I'm on a hormonal IUD which is good for up to six years and over 99% effective. Why am I telling you this? To normalize it. When we normalize it and make it a general topic of conversation, we lift the burden off of one party. Going through heterosexual relationships, I felt the burden of how to prevent pregnancy more often than the other party. Normalizing the hard things in life doesn't make it any less hard to talk about, but it does make it easier to talk about. Yes, unplanned pregnancies do happen from unprotected and sometimes protected sex. From there, we must be straightforward with the information that is available and show grace to those who must make the hard decisions. Whether it's parenthood, abortion, or adoption, show them grace.